So just tell me about your childhood and what you remember. Um, kind of just like what it was like growing up. In what respect? In any respect. Just tell me about your childhood. It's like a basic. Um, I was the seventh of eight kids. We uh, lived in the poor neighborhood of town. I grew up, I was born in 1954, so I grew up mostly in the 60s. I um, had the first few years of my life in a town where it was all white people, and then um, my summer between first and second grade, we moved to a larger town right to the edge of a black neighborhood. Yeah, I know more about marches within my own town. Okay, yeah, tell me okay. about those. Well, there were local things going on at the same time. And again, I'm in small town America. What town? Ed, do you want me to say? Okay, Edwardsville, Illinois. Again, I live on the edge of the black neighborhood. You know, neighborhoods were not integrated. Okay, there were white neighborhoods and then there were black neighborhoods and I lived in the poor white neighborhood. Next door to me uh, started the black neighborhood. And I remember sit-ins and all of the black people coming down the street from their neighborhood to go downtown. And it was unusual to just see an organized mass of people walking. And a lot of them were um, like my older brothers and sisters age, so they were like young adults, high school, college, young adults. And I remember... Would they possibly be SIUE students? No, SIUE was a commuter campus and hardly anybody was there at that time. It just had like one building in a cornfield, okay? So no, it was within the town itself uh, because most of the middle-aged blacks just minded their own business, just tried to earn a living and did not want to create controversy. So this was younger ones and I would say mostly like early, tw maybe early 20s who couldn't find a job. But when they came down the street, I remember that it, it was something unusual and being told maybe that I should stay in the house, but I, I wasn't, I didn't, because they were people that I knew, but their whole manner was different because being in that neighborhood, I was known, liked, and accepted. And I remember asking, where are you going? You know, and it's like, downtown, you need to stay here. And that's something that I'm very aware of. Um, being treated differently than I ever had been before uh, because it got turned and it was like, okay, now white people are being treated a certain way because of the color of their skin. And so all of a sudden I was the enemy, whereas before I had been the neighbor and the friend. And so, but there was also a level of protection there for me. And that happened on several instances. And But mostly I never really saw sit-ins. I work with the uh, a girl who worked at a bank right out of high school and there was a major sit-in in the lobby of her bank. So she experienced quite a bit of it. But there was also a um, takeover of the high school um, gymnasium hallway, I guess is the best way to put that. It was this area of lockers where most of the black students had their lockers. Again, segregated, but not really segregated. It's just they, they all happened to fall that way, but that was where the, the blacks hung out. And uh, they were angry and they weren't letting anyone through that hallway to get to the cafeteria, which is also where study halls were. And so everybody had to go this really long way around. And I don't even remember this guy's name, but he was big and muscular and very scary. And um, I came down the hallway and they all formed a line across the hallway. And you know, the administrators were just hiding somewhere, you know, <laughs> it's like trying to figure out how to deal with it. And I was sort of being confronted until they saw that it was me and they said I could go on through and that was interesting you know so I, I got to pass through when most people did not and um, the same thing happened at City Park um, and actually I uh, sort of saved a white kid one time I, <laughs> I asked a black friend of mine um, if they would if he would ask his friends to leave this guy alone and he did what did that guy do to provoke? Who, the white guy? Mm -hmm. Nothing. He was just white. Oh. But he was probably a known racist. Mm -hmm. you know? 
Uh, I think when you grow up around that, no matter how many airs and pretends people try to put on, it's you still know. And I think I saw a different perspective because um, I had come from a town where there were absolutely no blacks. And in the summertime, I made friends with uh, two girls next door who were black. And I actually liked them better than the little white girls around the corner. And it wasn't until I got to school that fall that it was made apparent to me that I wasn't supposed to be friends with black people. Um, but it was too late, you know, I was already friends with them and I already knew them as people rather than as somebody with the color of a skin you don't socialize with. So I think throughout the whole movement I felt more like I was in the middle of something when it was like whites against blacks and the hatred that you saw because that's not what I saw. And if one thing I can tell you is that I saw a lot more prejudice of whites against blacks than blacks against whites. Or maybe it's just poor is poor, no matter what color you are. Um, but once you were accepted in and trusted by the black community, they will love you and protect you and rally around you. And I didn't see that in the white community toward black people. But again, that was just my perspective. Okay, so will you tell me what you know about the uh, assassination of JFK? Uh, I remember being in third grade and it being announced and it was like everybody's world just, it was like the world ended because nothing like that had ever happened before and it was disbelief and then I remember I told you I started reading the newspaper every day and I came home and started, I read the newspaper article about it. And I just remember the non-stop coverage on the news and um, Walter Cronkite had to take off his glasses and cry. And he was like the world's most professional newscaster. And for him to do that, it was like the whole world lost its bearings, you know, and didn't know what to do or which way to turn. And if anything, um, Jackie Kennedy was very strong and that she I, it's really weird because it's almost like she set the tone of how it should be and when little John John you know did that you know that just really broke everybody but it was more like nobody knows where to go from here I don't think anybody really ever bought into the Lee Harvey R's Oswald and you know um, that there's more behind it and when Jack Ruby shot him it was to silence him and then um, that whole thing has never been found out you know but I'm not into the whole conspiracy, two shots, and, and all that kind of stuff, but I, I don't really know what happened there. But um, that started a time period where I think the world changed. We lost our innocence. And we totally lost our innocence after that, and I don't think the world's been the same ever since. Did you feel or could you tell that that had a profound um, effect or influence on the way the civil rights might um, continue? Yes and no, again, because I was really young. Um, I felt like the Democrats were more sympathetic than the Republicans were. But I, w I really thought with Lyndon Johnson being from Texas from the South that it would be worse because it was some from the South, but he actually passed the Civil Rights Bill, the, that amendment, and um, did more. But at the time, it was bleak and black and depressing, and the whole world, it was like the whole, our whole United States had no, no hope, you know. And then what about the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr.? That was... To happen once with President Kennedy was one thing, but then it happened again, and to me that was twofold. Well, it was a lot more than that, you know, because he did peaceful demonstrations. He wasn't hurting anyone. Uh, he was shot in cold blood. It was that there's been a second assassination. It would be like in today's terms if there was a second World Trade Center, you know, like say a year later or a couple of years later, we had had another thing like that. And then that's what sort of happened. And then there's Bobby Kennedy. It's like everywhere you turn around, people are getting assassinated. And uh, there's no stability in our world anymore. With um, Martin Luther King Jr., 
I can only tell you my own perspective was he was a minister. You know, I mean, he, he was a non-violent minister, man of God, um, and it was just appalling, and I think it made a lot of black people lose hope. So, and then maybe from there is where a lot of more of the violent things came in rather than the non-violence. But um, even now, when we have like Martin Luther King Day, I just feel like a lot of white people tolerate it. It's like, oh yeah, what are we taking off for? You know, and treat it as a black holiday. And it just gripes me, you know, because I just think he was such a man of wisdom. And had he lived, uh, I just felt like there could have been so much resolution between blacks and whites at a, at a much sooner time. I really felt like he could have brought people together, although... I don't know, uh, racism is, there's so much hatred. I think that's what I saw with um, the white racism and people saying that they're Christians and then acting in such a racist manner. Even as a young child, I could see um, that that doesn't equal, that doesn't compute. Um, so what did you, how did you feel about the nonviolent movement and Martin Luther King and his legacy and all of that? I think he's awesome. I think you can accomplish a whole lot doing it that way, and it takes the higher road. And it's like, even though you're mistreating me, I'm still going to do what's right. You know, I'm going to point it out to you, but I'm still going to do what's right. And I think most white people respected that approach. They did not respect the violent approach, and that did more harm than good, at least in white people's eyes. Um... Do you think that actual change can occur while using nonviolence, or do you think that it's too easy for people to just push them to the side and that no real change can come when you're using tactics like nonviolence? I don't know. I, I understand both sides of that, but um, no, I still think non nonviolence, because look at Gandhi. You know, I think if you get enough numbers, you can change things with without violence. I, re I really think you can. At least I've, I've got to believe that. Because I don't think violence just begets more violence. You know, and it's like um, the Hatfields and the McCoys, the North versus the South. You know, I mean, it's the age-old story that when it's that personal and there's violence involved, there's always somebody that wants to get an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So I think it's a vicious cycle of never ending when you introduce violence. Um, what was your um, perspective about uh, Malcolm X and um, Black Power and the Nation of Islam? Um, I don't understand the whole Black Muslim thing. I thought it, I thought it was a way of empowerment, but I almost felt like he took something and turned it to meet his own needs to somehow legitimize the violence, but yet at the same time. What he did is he, uh, I'm trying to put this in a way, legitimized black people, made black people feel good about themselves and um, to stand up for themselves. And that was also a valuable element that needed to be there. I guess black pride is the way to put that rather than always not accepting that you were put down or you were the lower class or you went to the back of the bus but it was like hey we're black and that's fine and that's good and we're proud of being black so in that respect you know it was good but I did not understand the whole black Muslim thing and taking a different name and I didn't really see I guess I knew just enough about the Muslim Muslim religion to be uh, ignorant, but I didn't understand why that got pulled into it, why Islam got pulled into it, I guess, and the whole black Muslim thing I've never quite understood. Um, do you think that, from the white perspective, that people were, that Malcolm X um, allowed people to like Martin Luther King's ideas of nonviolence more because they might be scared of, you know, the violent tendencies of, like, Malcolm X or I think like that. Malcolm X did a whole lot of damage for the movement, to tell you the truth, because I felt like people... The fact that Martin Luther King was a minister and the approach that he was using was reasonable, 
and I really felt like a lot of progress was being made, and I felt that Malcolm X and the whole violent thing, it was easy for whites to hang their hat on and take their prejudice and justify it because of the violence. They could say, see, we told you. You can't trust them. They need to be put down. It gave um, white forces that were established a really good reason to use violence against black people. You know, it's one thing to open up hydrants and spray down people who are doing absolutely nothing and they also show dogs biting, biting people who've done nothing. That would be like uh, the pepper spray on the Occupy people. There was such an outrage. But if those people had been being violent and like looting things and turning over cars and setting things on fire and had been pepper sprayed, everybody would have said, yeah, and they deserved it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm trying to give you a correlation here. So in that respect, say somebody came along uh, now and said, oh, this Occupy movement is totally disorganized. They don't know what they want. Uh, they want everything, but they're not being specific in what they want. And I do think that is an argument that's sort of internal right now. But... And that is most of the establishment's arguments against them. But if somebody came along now and said, well, we're not reaching anybody because they're blowing us off, so now we're going to get violent. Say that whole thing again. No. <laughs> Go back like a minute and start there. About East St. Louis? Yeah. Taking the by state bus? Yeah. Okay. When? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so anyway, I, I think the violence causes more of a problem. Uh, because I would take the bi-state bus from Edwardsville down to downtown St. Louis to go shopping. And that used to be a safe thing to do, but when the bus would go through East St. Louis and you saw all the burned out buildings and the crime, uh, a lot of uh, the protests were a cover for just being violent, committing crimes, you know. And people moved out of East St. Louis. East St. Louis used to be a very booming town. All the whites moved out. The businesses moved out. You couldn't run a business there if you were afraid it was going to get burnt down. You know, so uh, now it's just a shell. It can hardly even manage itself. It, there used to be so much business in there. And what's, what disturbs me the most is there was a lot of black business. Even when things were somewhat segregated, you had wealthy black people who owned businesses that catered to the black community. So there were more jobs. You know, now there's just nothing going on there because it was destroyed. And I just think, I guess the whole violent approach is a very negative, destructive approach. <coughs> How do you feel about um, Muhammad Ali and Cassius Clay? Well, at the time, I just thought he was a strange character anyway because he's like, I am the greatest, you know. And his name was Cassius Clay, but then he converted and became Muhammad Ali. And I think most people, most white people just didn't get it, just didn't understand. But for black people, he probably lent a good air to that. And it seemed like um, his boisterousness timid it down a little bit. And so it was maybe like, well, maybe there is something to being a black Muslim. But... Um, uh, again, he was a spokesman for black people, and, and I take all that kind of stuff with a grain of salt because I don't think one person can speak for a group. Yeah. Is there anything else uh, about your childhood that you remember that stands out? As far as civil rights? Yeah. Um, Any stories? Not in particular about discrimination or... About your personal life that you had, like encounters. Uh, you want to know about my sister. <laughs> my sister went, my sister came from a very small town, not that it was a little smaller town, had never seen a black before in her life, and went to SIU Carbondale to college, where she met a black man uh, who she ended up marrying, for better, for worse, whatever. We're, um, I'll let that go. In the course of that, there, you know, it was 60s. I think they felt like they were being progressive, but it caused a lot of problems for both them, their children, us as a family, um, because the prejudice against blacks affected our entire family because my sister married a black man, um, and there were biracial children, and even today still, it's like people look at us a little strange because 
uh, there's a wedding in the family or something, and the other side of the family are like, what? You know, when black people show up, and it's like, oh, and they're family? You know, so I, as much as we want to think that prejudice is a thing of the past, it is not, you know. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to have it over there, but to have it right here is something totally different. And I guess that's a unique perspective because even our, our black family member was half black, half American Indian. Doesn't matter, he's black, you know. And now, um, what is this, two more generations down, uh, there are some that are maybe an eighth or a sixteenth black, but in the world's view, they're black. Because it's like if you have a drop of black in you that makes you black, you know. And those girls could tell you some interesting stories of growing up. Uh, they went to private Catholic girls' schools and were very highly educated, but they did a talk one time on black jive. <laughs> they, you know, they came in and did the whole neighborhood talk, you know. So uh, they could go in and out of social classes, and it was it was pretty cool. So. I try as best as I can for color to just not make a difference to me, but sometimes I know that I'm the odd one out, and if I'm in a crowd or in a situation, and I see where I feel, because I don't want to go out of my way and go like, hey, I like blacks, you know, because to me that's showing that there's a difference too, but if I see in a social situation where a black person is being snubbed or is feeling uncomfortable, I will make a point to include that person. You know, at least it's like, hey, one person here accepts you, you know, or go sit by that person and make conversation with them because I, it just really bothers me to see anybody snub that way. Yeah, because you're not that way, just black people, but just anyone. Anyone. Yeah. Uh, any nationality, any kind of person. I just, uh, we're all God's children and I just don't want to ever think that I'm better than anybody else. Hey, Lemieux, do you, do you like black cats or white cats? She's biracial. Ha, <laughs> <laughs>